because the management and transparency is what's very important. So once you submit a referral, you're going to have your own home advantage account and it's going to tell you where everything sits. So if you have 10 referrals that you've sent into the network, it's going to give you all 10 referrals. It's going to tell you every milestone that that client is sitting in, whether they're touring homes, whether they're in escrow. And you now can manage through the home advantage application as far as what your pipeline looks like for the referrals that you've sent. And so it's pretty sophisticated uh, and it's, it's all click of a button, guys. The psychology of sales and negotiations, how to overcome the infamous word no that we've become so accustomed to is going to be a big piece of our conversation today. I'm excited and I just, just I met this gentleman literally uh, less than three minutes ago. And so as, as most of you know from this podcast, uh, I oftentimes get most excited for the people that I've never talked to or never met because I get to ask a bunch of questions and selfishly learn for myself. And today's guest wrote a book uh, just called that. No, The Psychology of Sales and Negotiations. He's wrote several other successful books, uh, has co-created and built multiple companies, exited companies, uh, currently owns restaurants, uh, real estate, uh, and I believe even tech. And uh, so I'm excited today uh, because not just all of that, that's the obvious, but also uh, this gentleman recently was hanging out on Necker Island with Richard Branson. So of course, I'm going to ask questions about that as well, because that's, that's, a, that's a bucket list that most of us will never check off. Uh, so welcome to the show, Brian Will. Jeff, I can't believe I'm on your show today, man. Lab Coach Agents. This is awesome. I appreciate you having me. Ah, you're too kind. You're too kind. Coming from the guy who was sitting at breakfast with Richard Branson, I don't think <laughs> I'm, I'm It's even I'm... better than that, Jeff. The last <laughs> morning, not only were we at breakfast, but Richard gets this idea, a song in his head, up from the Chippendales dancers, goes and finds it, comes back, jumps up on the dining room table, and he's dancing through everybody's plates down the dining room table with this song blasting in the background. I mean, when do you get an opportunity to see that? Wow. Well, I mean, now that now that I brought it up, you know, obviously, I, well, you know what, actually, we're going to wait, we're going to wait a second for that. I want to hear more about that and that bucket list trip that you took. Uh, but let's start here, because, you know, I'm going to going to assume our audience may not know who you are. So tell us about yourself. Tell us about, you know, kind of what led you to where you are today, uh, kind of your journey through business, and then where you are today. Yeah, so I, I call myself the most um uneducated person you've probably ever met that's been successful in business. Now I've met a lot of people, a lot of other people that are the same as me, but I'm the kid who failed out of high school at 16, managed to graduate, but with a 1.2, didn't go to college, had to join the military because I got kicked out of the house, came from a bad background, got off active duty, couldn't hold a job. So I decided to start my own business. Started my first business in landscaping, did that for eight years. We built it into seven franchises, got out of that industry, got into the insurance industry, built the first direct-to-consumer call center in the country, sold it to a, a venture capital firm in 1999, turned it into a company called Connecture, which went public and then back private, started another one uh, that we sold to a venture capital company. And today it powers, I think, 10 states for the ACA for health insurance, started another company that we sold to a private equity firm, which was in the online marketing space, got out of that, started doing consulting and sales and marketing and sales and marketing management for Fortune 500 companies. I've trained thousands of people over the years, have sold billions and billions of dollars through the teams that we've trained, wrote, started writing these books. I've got three books out, two are Wall Street Journal bestsellers, and uh, re most recently got into politics. I sat on city council in my hometown and started a entrepreneur coaching program called The Force Multiplier. So that's me in a nutshell. I love it. There's a lot to unpack there, man. I, there is, there is. I'm going to, I'm going to dial in on two things. First of all, politics. Is that just a, is that just like a hobby thing or is that something you, you, you have I've always aspired for? You know, I've always been interested in politics. The challenge with politics, as you know, that is it, it can be a very dirty, nasty business. And unfortunately that keeps a lot of good people out of politics. And there's a quote by Redmond Burke that says, all it takes for evil to prevail is for a few good people to do nothing. And so once we had sold the companies and I was looking for what I could do to give back, because you know, you have to give back in your life. You know, I thought, why don't I jump into politics uh, and see what I can do? So I got elected in my city council in my hometown 
And uh, that's been going really well. We've made a big positive change in, in what we've done there. And uh, so 2026, watch out. There's a announcement coming soon. Cool. And you're based out of Alpharetta, Georgia. So for those of you in the Atlanta market, uh, you know, I guess uh, they, they is, is there a place that they can they can go find you locally or they can go support you? Yeah, I mean, I'll, I mean, I'm all over the Internet. So BrianWillMedia.com is my website. It's got everything about me. Alpharetta website. You can look up what we do there. Uh, I've enjoyed politics a lot. I, I will have to tell you, I enjoy making a difference. We'll put it that way. I love it. I love it. So what would you say is, is your most, your pat, your current passion that drives you the most besides this political venture? So I like to say that we've taken, I'm, I've taken 35 years of experience in buying and selling companies and doing corporate consulting training, you know, very large sales teams selling billions of dollars. And I've brought it back down to this new business, which we call the force multiplier. And we're taking what we call well-funded startups through 10 million in revenue. And we, we work on strategic business direction, building high-performance sales teams, measured profitable growth, and then what I call time travel. And time travel is reverse P&L analysis using pattern recognition and your core metrics to predict the future of your business. So I'm passionate about working with young entrepreneurs. And I don't mean young in age. I mean young entrepreneurs and their growth of their entrepreneurial journey. To help them really scale and launch their businesses. That's a good thing because the real estate business has an average age somewhere in the 50s. And and it's <laughs> and, and I and I do want to mention to our audience who are listening right now, uh, obviously, my job is to obviously help uh, uh shift and drive this conversation because clearly you you have a very strong expertise around sales and uh, obviously negotiation, all these things that are very relevant to the real estate industry. Uh, and so, you know, my job here is to 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 drive it down the real estate path. And I'm going to bring up sure. at least one video that I watched of yours that I would say is not applicable uh, to real estate. But before we get there, you know, and and you just mentioned the reverse engineering of a PL. I don't even know how many real estate agents actually effectively have a PL, have even gone through that, you know, gone through that task of kind of building one out. I was watching some of your videos because you're in the restaurant business and how, mm -hmm. you know, one ounce of alcohol, for example, can <laughs> completely destroy a restaurant. Yes. Um, maybe, maybe share that with our audience because I think you can do it in a short amount of time. But then I'd like your take just simply on the importance of having and operating and running a PL for an individual real estate agent's business. I think where a lot of real estate agents are missing is the fact that they're missing. Let me rephrase that. I think what they're missing is the fact that they actually own a business. So many real estate agents think, well, I'm just a real estate agent. And I may have a broker that works over me. No, no, no. You own a business. That's what you do. And if you're going to be effective at running your business and you're going to maximize your ability to make a profit, you need to run your real estate business like an actual business, right? You need to do all the things you're supposed to do in a business. You need to track all the numbers you track. You need to look at the lead flow you're coming in and your ROI on your marketing costs and your, your, return, on, your return on everything that you do. You need to do time tracking. You, you really need to focus on what you do if you want to get good. And then if you ever become a broker and you start bringing agents in, that's where it gets really important because you need to be able to track everything inside that business. So I will tell you the book, No, and you brought this up earlier. It's interesting. It's not about the book. No, is really from a salesperson's perspective, what they're probably going to get every single time they talk to a customer, right? How many customers have you talked to? And the first thing they say is, well, no, I'm not interested or no, I'm not ready or no, I can't, I, I can't do it today. Or no, I have to think about it or what. It's all about the psychology behind what the consumer, the customer, the client is thinking. And if you understand that, it will increase your close ratios significantly. And I don't care what business you're in or industry. So yeah. the book is very, very relevant to any type of sales and specifically real estate. Good Weirdly work. enough, when that book launched, it was number one in real estate sales for like three weeks. I believe it. It was, it was crazy. I believe it because I mean, well, and you know, as you know, and, and again, I, I, I want to ask some other questions before we get too too far down this rabbit hole. But you know, uh, our industry is is first of all massively diluted. Uh, number one, number two, it's it you know it's everybody's competing against each other. You know, so it's not brokers against brokers; it's literally agent against agent. Even though some of them are on your own team, team, uh, mm -hmm. you're literally competing against them. And so the 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 competition for attention, the competition for you know. It, 
agents are, in my opinion, real estate is the worst spammers on the planet. We have become <laughs> that. We we now we now carry the ranks of 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 used car salesmen. And I say this when I speak, and I describe it that way to agents, especially as it relates to social media. And and so everybody's rushing to sell something that most consumers don't need right now, and mm -hmm. therefore that's why we qualify as a spammer. I want to I want to halt that right there because I want to go back. I want to I want to get deep on this before we get deep on this stuff because it's very relevant for an agent. And we could give countless, you know, examples of when you receive a no, right? When you're calling mm -hmm. on a lead, when you're door knocking, calling Fizbos, whatever it is, right? Social media marketing. Um, so let's 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 halt that for now because before I get too deep, I have to ask you how this Necker Island came to be and what it's like hanging out with somebody like Richard Branson. So we're going to, we're going to totally divert and go personal for a second because I'm fascinated by that. You know, it's been on my bucket list. So I have a list of four people that I have that are on my bucket list to meet Richard Branson, Elon Musk, Peyton Manning, and Kenny Chesney. These are my top four, right? Music, entertainment, and two cool. in business. Cool. So Richard Branson has been on my bucket list for a long time. I have sailed the BBIs many times and sailed around Necker Island and always wanted to go. A friend of mine who had just sold her company has uh, been there about 20 times. She knows it's on my bucket list. And she got invited to speak for an organization called Change Makers Rule Breakers, which was hosting an event there. 14 people. We had the entire island in Richard for five days. So she called me. She said, would you like to go? And I said, I would love to go. And so I ended up on Necker Island, not understanding really what was all involved. I didn't realize the amount of time and effort Richard puts into the guests when they come to the island. But I mean, we had breakfast every day, lunch, dinner. We had drinks. We took, went kite surfing. We took the speedboat to different islands. And he's there with us the whole time. And uh, I was telling you earlier, the, the first morning I was sitting there, there were three scheduled speakers. The first morning I was sitting at breakfast and he starts asking me about me and my life. And I was telling him what I do and had written a couple books. And he asked me about my first book. My first book is called I Give the Dumb Kids Hope. And it's a book about overcoming an abusive rough childhood and going on to succeed in life. And he asked me to tell the story and I started telling the story at breakfast. And within a few minutes, he goes, okay, you're speaking tomorrow at 10 a.m. I want the whole group here to hear this story. And so while these people all had PowerPoint presentations and they had, you know, ready to go, I'm like scratching notes on a piece of paper, getting ready to do this, this talk, which I called my pre-TED talk. Um, and so I did it the next day and it was just like, wow, I'm sitting on Necker Island in what they call the temple, right? speaking to a group of worldwide entrepreneurs from Africa, Australia, Canada, the US, all over the place and doing this little TED talk because Richard was so fascinated with, with the story I told him. I mean, it doesn't get any better than that. I would argue that that might be better than a TED talk. We go to, to lunch one day, we took this speedboat over to Anagata Island. Now we took the speedboat, Richard kite surfed. He's on his 73rd birthday, crazy story. He kite surfs the whole 12 miles. We get to lunch and I'm sat in at lunch with him and he starts questioning me on politics. And so we had a 45 minute discussion on politics and world events, me and Richard Branson. Who gets to do that? Like, yeah. and he's, he's saying things like, you know, I was talking to, uh, you know, uh, Nelson Mandela and, uh, and I'm like, yeah, well, I was talking to Joe down at the bar, you know, <laughs> it's, it's almost no way to relate the two, but yeah. Fascinating conversation. What, uh, what, what would you say is probably one of the more interesting things about Richard that maybe you didn't realize before spending that time? The thing, two things struck me the most were the level of engagement he had with us. And the, and the two things that stuck out were after that conversation, we all took the boat back to the island and we had done a birthday party on the island for him. And that night the staff was doing a birthday party and he invited us to come to the birthday party that night, but I was taking a nap. So I didn't go. The next morning, I literally missed breakfast because I was tired. That day at lunch, we sat down at lunch and he said, Brian, you didn't come to my party and you didn't come to breakfast. Where were you? And I'm thinking to myself, Richard Branson actually noticed that I wasn't at his party and he noticed that I wasn't at breakfast and called me out on it. Wow. That's like, wow. That, that to me, that was like one of the coolest moments of the trip. Yeah. Just the fact that. It's not like he's superficially there, not paying attention and just doing his thing. No, he's engaged. That's crazy. That that's that's awareness at another level, uh, because I think most of us aren't. aren't I mean, uh, Richard Branson comes in contact with 
I, I can't even guess how many people and, uh, and stories I could tell you. I, give us one. Give I, us. I, I'll, I'll give you. So I was, we were sitting one night and I said, I said, let me ask you something, Richard. I said, when I sold my companies, I sold them like 15 years ago. And I really lost my interest in, in doing anything else at the time. Cause I just killed myself for 20 years. And finally I made a whole lot of money and got everything I ever wanted I lost my motivation. It took me years to get it back. I said, you're 73 years old. What drives you to keep doing things? You own 300 companies. I don't understand what drives you today. You're, you're living in paradise. You have a staff of 20 people that take care of everything. You have tennis pros and kite surfing pros. He said, Brian, if you have a talent and an ability to do something and you can use it to make a difference in the world, then you have an obligation to do it. doesn't matter how old you are. Mm. And I was just blown away by that. Yeah. Like, yep, you're right. And I need to step my game up because clearly I've been slacking. Wow. So, so for you, when you sold your companies and I'm sure you could financially retire if you wanted to, um, what did that look like for the next few years while you were lacking motivation? Are you playing a lot of golf? Are you just sleeping in every day? What does that look like? I immediately started getting calls for consulting. That's when I went into the consulting world. Uh, like unsolicited, people were just calling me, asking me to come do consulting for them and offering me just ob obnoxious amounts of money to do it. And when you sold a couple of companies, suddenly you become an industry expert, which is interesting. So I did that, but I did, I spent a few years, what I call chasing life's passions, right? I became a pilot. I bought an airplane. I became a dive master. I climbed some mountains. I jumped out of planes. I traveled the world. I've walked the great wall. I've ran with the bulls. I've done gate shark diving. I've done helicopter tours for Stellenbosch. I mean, I I've done everything people say they're going to do and they never actually do. I went and did. Wow. What's, what's miss is, is there anything on the list that you weren't able to accomplish just because of lack of time? There's still things on that are on my list. Sure. I still want to climb Kilimanjaro. I've done a bunch of 14ers in Colorado. I've done Mount Fuji with my children, uh, but Kilimanjaro is on my list. So that's another big, big one I want to do. And then Very basically good. just the rest of the world I haven't seen yet. So from a bucket list perspective, meeting my last three people and seeing the rest of the world. I was going to say, so choked. Branson's the only one of the four you've met. Yep. Okay. I still got to do Elon. And by the way, I was at SpaceX. I got an invite to go to SpaceX, sat in mission control uh, a couple of months ago. Um, the Boring Company, actually, we're bringing his company, The Boring Company, down to Alpharetta to do a tunnel for us, which is pretty cool out of that trip I did. And then Peyton Manning, because he's like my favorite athlete for you know 18 years. And Kenny Chesney's my favorite musician. So somehow, somewhere, some way, Anybody out there in this audience knows how I can meet them. <laughs> Hook me up. I'll take care of you. Hook that's me cool. up. <laughs> that's very, that's very, very cool. And are you, are you born and raised in Georgia? Ohio. Ohio. Little, okay. Little farm town in Ohio. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Then I'm trying to, I'm trying to put the ties together because I'm a sports guy. So I'm trying to figure out how in the hell you got to be a fan of, of Peyton Manning, because that's yep. not Indy. That's yep. not Denver. Nope. Uh, you know, so my mother and her husband uh, had a place out on, uh, in La Follette, Tennessee, uh, on the lake. And when my kids were young, we used to go to Tennessee all the time to hang out at the lake with my, my folks. Okay. And let me tell you something. If you were not flying orange back Got in it. those days, Got it. when Peyton was a quarterback at Tennessee, yeah. then you were liable to get rammed and sunk. So I became, and I, I started following the guy and I really liked him. And so I just followed his career all the way through. And when he retired, I basically almost stopped watching football. Wow. Cool. Fun. <laughs> He is, he is one of the great ones. I, I will agree with that. And I'm not, a, you know, I'm not a Colts fan. I'm not a Broncos fan, but I, I never, I had a hard time rooting against Peyton. Just yeah. a good dude. Just a good dude. I love it. Okay. Well now enough, enough of the stories. I could ask you these questions all day. That's very fascinating. I love it. It's inspirational. I hope someone else found, finds this inspirational. I listen to things like this and you know, it helps drive and motivate me. Maybe I'll never meet Richard Branson, but just hearing the stories, uh, to me is motivating. And we as real estate agents, I mean, why, why do you get your license? Uh, you get your license because of that flexibility. You get it for the dreams of the grandiose dreams of making a lot of money, right? Um, and most don't, right? Most are very part-time. I think there's, you know, the statistics this year, I was just talking to someone else on the podcast. There is uh, over 3 million licensed real estate professionals. Most go off the realtor stat, which is about one and a half million, but they forget that not everyone's a realtor, but there's, a, mm -hmm. there's about another one and a half million. And so there's about 3 million licensed real estate professionals and roughly 4 million transactions that are going to take place this year. That's a problem. And, and so 
agents, you got to step up your game. You got to learn this kind of stuff. So, you know, we, we started by talking a little bit about the PL before I diverted. And I want to ask you a question based on one of your videos, and we'll just take it to where this goes. Uh, and one of your videos, and it was a recent one, it was an Instagram video, and you talked about how you would rather, and I'm going to paraphrase here, but it was it was about uh, you want the now client, the client that wants to purchase yes. now versus <clears throat> the client that wants to purchase in six months. But the reality, Brian, and you know this, that doesn't really exist in the real estate space. The best agents are the ones who nurture. The best mm -hmm. agents are the ones who stay on top of mind with people over time because, hell, people buy on average every, what, seven years roughly? Uh, and so let's start there because you're a sales expert, bought, sold businesses, you know, you, you do all these things, right? You consult. So when you're talking to a real estate agent and your messaging is chase the, the client that's now. How do you respond to that? So we call this the three whys and a when. In fact, I think I did this video just yesterday. I saw that right? too. I saw that. And if too. you're gonna if you're gonna come in contact with your client, there's three things you need to know. Or there's four things you need to know. We call it three whys and a when. The first is, uh, why is your client shopping now? Why? Why are they shopping for a house? Why did they call you? Why did you come in contact with them? Why did they send? How did you get this? Lead? Why? Okay. So first, one, I want to know why they're shopping. And, and if it's because they just sold their house, it's because they're about to sell their house, it's because they're about to move, whatever the thing is, I need to know why. The second one is, I want to know why, and I'm asking you as a real estate agent, why they should buy a house from you. Why you, right? I, I normally say why your product, but in this case, we'll just say why you, because you're going to be the real estate agent in the transaction. Why should they buy it from you instead of somebody else? Why not call the person on the big billboard, you know, out on the highway, you know, when you're driving back and forth? Why not their sister-in-law? Why you? So you need to answer to yourself why they should buy from you. And until you can do that, you're going to be way less effective in what you do. If you can figure out why people should buy from you, then you've got a marketing strategy that you can go out and push, right? And then the third one is when. when you need to find out when they're looking to buy. And when is critical. Now, you're right. In your industry, you have to build a pipeline and you've got to be nurturing clients over time. But when I said you need to focus on the people that want to buy now as opposed to later, I didn't say blow them off and get rid of them and never talk to them again. That goes into the pipeline. But you need to find out when they're looking to buy so that you can properly place them in your pipeline so that you can properly spend the amount of time necessary with that client so that you will eventually get that sale done. But if all the clients I'm dealing with aren't buying for six months and I've got someone over here that's ready to buy right now, but I don't have time to talk to them, I'm making a huge mistake. I have to do both, but it's a matter of finding out when. So why are they shopping? Why should they use you as an agent? And that is a critical one. And then when are they looking? I had a person call me not too long ago and he said, Brian, I need some advice. I need a killer close line to get into this company to do some business with them. And I said, well, I said, Alan, why should they buy from you? And he said, well, because uh, I'll give them better service. I said, well, that's a bullshit answer. Everybody's going to say that. Yeah. He said, well, because I care more. I said, that's another bullshit answer. Everybody's going to say that. Yeah. He said, well, what is it? I said, I don't know. It's your business. You tell me, you go sit down and, and, and work with your friends or whoever it is, your mentor, your coach, and you figure out why they should buy from you. And when you come up with that, that's your hook. And that's what you lead with. And that's what will help you make sales. So Every real estate agent out there in the world isn't actually running a business. They haven't figured out why people should buy from them. And then when they do get clients, they don't find out when they're looking to buy and why they're looking to buy. And because of that, they waste a lot of time and energy. I promise you the best agents in, your, in the industry, when they hook up with a client, why are you looking? They already know why they're buying from you because you're one of the best in the industry. And then when are you looking? And that's how they properly place them in the pipeline. What I what I just heard you say, or the way I would articulate that is, and what you told Alan was, what is your value that differentiates you from everyone else? And this is a common, common conversation we're having. And, and as you can probably tell, I coach on social. It's the same conversation that I'm having with people. What differentiates you? Because yes. if you ask, if you ask, if if you or you or I went into our markets and interviewed a hundred real estate agents and said, What is your value prop? You and I both know that 98 or 99 are going to be a very similar answer, which yeah. is not value. It's their job. It's what everybody else can offer. And there's zero differentiation. So I'm, I'm, I'm sure you probably did tell Alan, go back to the drawing board, but I, I imagine that, and maybe Alan figured this out, but I, I think that there's a lot of professionals that 
struggle with that. Like, I, I don't, I don't, I don't know. I don't know. How do I figure that out? And so how would you coach or guide somebody to help them figure out that unique value prop? So this is one of the biggest mistakes I made in business for the first 20 years is I did not use a coach and a mentor. And I tried to figure out everything by myself and trying to figure out, trying to figure out everything by yourself is your fastest way not to grow fast. Okay. One of the most important things you can do if you're in any kind of business and being a real estate agent as a business is find somebody who is 20 steps ahead of you, who's already made the mistakes, who's already done all the things you're doing, who's already done it wrong and already done it right. Hire them, get them to be a coach or a mentor for you and sit down with them and say, okay, you're already 20 steps ahead of me. Tell me what I should be doing and then check your ego and listen because the people that are successful know how they did it. Very few people are just going to go, geez, I don't know. I just... I just got past my tests and people just started buying from me. It was luck. I mean, I, I didn't do anything special. No, they're going to know what they did. And if you will hire a good coach or a mentor, they will help you figure those things out. Successful business people don't have all the answers. Successful, be successful business people know how to ask the right questions to the right people. Hmm. That's, a, that's a very simple yet a powerful answer. Uh, because again, you know, uh, like I mentioned it, there's, there's 3 million and you just call it one and a half million. They're all around you. Uh, mm -hmm. and there's a lot of successful people all around you. So go, go ask them. If I asked you, if I asked you, and let's just say Alan was, we're just going to keep using him as the example, since you said the name, let's just say he was a real estate agent and he said, you know, what's your advice for me? Uh, what would you have said rather and I don't want you to say, go ask someone. I, I want to know what you have to say, because you, you know this industry. What would you say? It depends on the person, right? So this requires a little deep dive analysis into who the individual is. I need to know who they are, what their background is, what their interests are. Like, I know that if I'm a, a, a giant guy that likes to fly planes and, and jump out of them and do, then I might market to that particular, particular market, right? If, if I'm a scuba diver, I might market to the scuba diving market. I'm a restaurant owner, so I might market inside of to, to whatever it is that you are good at or that your passion is outside of what you're doing here. Find that market and go market to it. That's what I would have said. You know, I'm not a real estate expert, but that's what I would that's what I would do from a yeah, from a AKA, standpoint. AKA lean into your authenticity. And well, but it's but it's called making a connection. You know, people yeah. like to buy from people that they they have something in common with that they like and they trust. And if I can find the connection between me and you then you're going to immediately like me more than you, you know, the next person that comes down the road. I was at dinner last night, this no joke. And the waitress at the restaurant who I've known for the last 10 years, she said, guess what, Brian? I said, what? She goes, I have a new business. I said, what? She hands me her real estate card. This literally just happened. I said, oh, you're getting into real estate. She said, yeah, I can't wait. I'm like, how are you going to market yourself? She says, I have no idea. <laughs> I'm like, well, you're sitting in a, one of the most popular restaurants in Clearwater Beach. You made a good start by handing me your business card, but I already bought 10 houses in Tampa in the last year and a half, and I live in Atlanta. So I think I'm tapped out at the moment, but, but, but that's a good way to start making connections. Yeah. Just start letting your customers know. Let people know what you do. How many people that are in business and people don't know what they do? Yeah. So let's go back to the, the three whys and a win. And, and so you, you, know, you, you articulated that and you explained it. Uh, can, you, can you go a little bit more granular for a real estate agent. So as they're, as they're meeting that consumer. So again, it, it could be a waitress with, with, with the, you know, uh, somebody eating at the restaurant, or, you know, it could be somebody that you come across at your church, or maybe somebody that comments on your social media or slides into your DM or something like that. You know, how do you shift the conversation? Because in our world, it is very passive. You know, again, it's not it's not a consumer. It's it's not a daily need. We're not selling a product that they can't survive without, and they're only going to buy one, two, three, four of them in their lives on average, right? So, how do you shift into that conversation to figure out the why at first with a lot of passive potential consumers? You know, and it's funny. Again, I'm going to use an example that I got this morning. Um, and we, this is, this will get a little bit into lead gen and, and approaching people. So I, I really started pushing my social media in the last six months and I've gained, I don't know, maybe 50,000 followers across all platforms and people today, I'll probably get three or four requests a day where people are coming in and they're on LinkedIn or Facebook or Instagram or whatever. And they're hooking into me and I always just accept it and I ignore it. Well, I requested somebody today on Instagram, a guy named Dan Martell. I don't know if you've ever heard of Dan, but he's a big coach. 
And his immediate response was, hey, Brian, thanks for connecting with me. Uh, are you just interested in my videos or are you looking to expand your business? And I said, well, I mean, I am looking to expand a business, but I think we do the same thing. But it kicked off a conversation. And then we had this long conversation about what I do and how he does it and, and whatnot. And I thought to myself, I've, I've had 50,000 people come into my social media and I'm not one time have I ever asked them if they were looking for coaching or, to, you know, or any help in anything. Yeah. So the very next person that hit me 10 minutes later, I did it. And he comes back, he goes, well, yeah, actually I am looking for something. So I think it's just a matter of letting people know what you do. If they're, if you're on social media immediately, Hey man, by the way, just let you know, I do sell real estate. If I can ever help you, let me know. What if I am following your lead though, because that makes sense because your niche, your content strategy is around what you coach about, what you're an expert about. But as we all know, the problem with real estate agents is, is, is real estate is to, they inundate their audiences with real estate. And the reality is nobody opens up social media. And I, I, I emphasize the word social because it's not business media. They, they, they open up social to, to see your French bulldog, to see mm -hmm. your golfing, your traveling, you growing tomatoes, you making a recipe. So on one side of the coin, it's like lean into how you can connect with them, lean into your authenticity, right? You, you mentioned that if, if you're into scuba diving. And so let's just say I do that and I'm a, I'm a, I, I scuba dive regularly. So I just share, I document what I'm doing yep. and I make connections with people who have a similar interest. Don't you think it seems a little slimy when somebody comments on my post and, and says, oh my God, that's so awesome. I really want to go scuba there. Or, hey, I have a suggestion. You should go scuba here because I've done this. And then you just twist it around. I'm like, hey, by the way, I sell real estate. Like, isn't that a turnoff? So we, we do the entertain, entertain, educate on social media, right? So a lot of what we do is entertainment. And then some of it is educate. Mm -hmm. And I am very careful because I, I what I don't like is when people LinkedIn with me or Facebook in with me. And, and the very, as soon as I hit accept, I get this pitch. I hate that. Yeah. Yep. Right. I, I don't do that. Um, I basically put up entertain, 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 and then educate. Now, if somebody's linking in with me, if they've requested me, that's when I would send that message out. I don't link in with them or request them and then send an immediate message. I, I don't like that at all. So, uh, makes sense. That, it's like the old jab, ahead. jab, jab hook from yeah. Gary V. Yep. Yep. And that's actually where I got that from. I love it. Entertain, entertain, educate. I like it. I like it. That sounds like your next uh, book title. <laughs> I just want to get credit for it. If that actually, if that actually happens. <laughs> with credit to Jeff. <laughs> yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Um, okay, cool. So let's, let's get into this whole no thing, because obviously this is your expertise. This is what the book is about, the psychology of sales and negotiations. And again, you know, we, we live in this world uh, where, you know, it's, it's very passive with our consumers. And so agents have all experienced no in so many different ways from leads, from walk-ins, from literally, you know, again, just just maybe opening up a conversation with somebody passively out in public at a networking event. And, and it's, it's probably no more often than anything by far. And so can you, can you dig us into this, this psychology and how we need to be handling this? So the gist of the book is on negotiation, right? And interestingly enough, I wrote this before I ever even knew I was going to Necker Island, but the concept behind no actually came from one of Richard Branson's books. It's called screw it, just do it. In fact, he said that comment to me on the island, which I loved. It was awesome. Um, but one of the comments he says, if your first offer doesn't insult them, you've offered too much. And the reason is because in most negotiations, if you're up against a good negotiator, they're going to say no to your first offer, whatever it is. I mean, look at every real estate transaction in the world. Everybody knows you don't accept the first offer. Now, maybe a year and a half ago when you know we were offering over, over asking price and things were crazy, but in a normal world, the first offer is probably never going to be accepted. So that's the first thing we need to understand is, is when we are negotiating with somebody, the first thing they'll probably say to us is no on price. So if we know that, then we have to start with what we call anchoring the sale or anchoring the bottom. And this probably applies more to the people selling the house than the agents, but the agents need to understand the psychology behind what's happening. And as a salesperson, you need to be able to figure out what all the client's objections are going to be to the house in this case, because it's real estate. And then build a sales process around those objections 
so that you can overcome them before we ever get to the back end of the negotiation, right? So for instance, we know that the seller is probably not going to take the first offer. So why offer them close to asking? You're anchoring too high. I'd offer them something lower, anchor it lower just to see where they are. Uh, back to Richard, I hate to say this, but he bought Necker Island for $180,000 and they were asking $6 million. That's an insane drop in price. But what happened was they were asking six. He offered 180. They laughed at him, told him to go away. And a couple of years later, the guy called and said, I'm getting divorced and I don't want my wife to get any money. So I'll sell you the island for 180,000. And he said, done, right? We call that playing the long game. So, wow. but he anchored it at 180. Who knows what he would have paid, but he got it because he set the bar so low that it came back up. So if we know that we're going to have to anchor that sale, we anchor it at a lower amount than what we're probably willing to pay. This is the game, buy low, so high. I'm offering more, you're offering less kind of thing. But understand that the client, that's what they're thinking. That's what the, the seller's thinking. And then we have to work within that. So the other challenge I see with a lot of agents is they're not willing to get involved in that negotiation, right? Like I typically will use a buyer's agent when I buy properties. And even then the agent I use here in Tampa, and, and I love her, she's awesome, but she's not a good negotiator, right? If I could find somebody who was a killer negotiator on the real estate side, I'd probably switch and use them. So I end up having to tell her how to do the negotiation on all the sales. Hmm. And, you know, we stick with the anchor. We stick with the anchor. We stick with the anchor until the client's willing to walk away. And then we start raising our price until we get the deal done. That's just psychology. So uh, go a little deeper on that, because I don't think a lot of agents do have that expertise. So give us a good example of what you've done and why. And okay, agents yep. that consider it. So I had a friend call me and she was, uh, she was selling her house and she let's, I'm going to use some fake numbers here for a minute. She said, uh, I'm selling the house for one, uh, 99 and they've offered me one sixty three. I said, come back and tell them it's one ninety eight. She goes, but they're offering one sixty three. I said, yeah, I know they're anchoring at one sixty three. That's what they think they're going to drive you down to. Cause they think if they're so low, they're going to drive that. You're going to start driving your dropping your price rapidly. So go back at one ninety eight. Went back at 198, she said they came up to 170. I said, go back down to 190. We knew she would take 180, by the way. And it went from 190 to 165 to 168 and 185. And finally we got to 180. And she said, well, they're only going to take, give me 178. And I said, look, they've been negotiating on this house with you for three days. They're not going to walk away for two grand. And she said, they came back and told me that I wasn't going to walk away for two grand. And I said, then tell them, yes, you will right? This is just holding the line on what you want. I said, your worst case scenario is you're now going to get 178. That's the worst thing that could happen. They're not going to say, you know what, screw it. I'm going to walk away and never buy this house from you, even if I can get it for the price I want. Mm -hmm. And she called me back. She goes, they said they do 180. I said, I told you, we're, we're just, pl we're playing a game. It's, a, it's two negotiators against each other. Unfortunately, you had me on your side, or fortunately for you, unfortunately for them, and you got the 180 you wanted. So, it's just a game of, of who's gonna, who, who is willing to walk away from that sale first. And when you are, at least you know where that anchor now is, right? So again, we're just, it's a psychology negotiation. I always tell people, if you're not a good negotiator, bring in somebody who is. Because if you don't and you're up against a good negotiator, they're going to eat your lunch. So now let's talk about what's the reality now, because what you just described doesn't exist in today's world. Everything is going over ask because we have a lack of inventory. And so it's it's funny how it's working now. In fact, I was just having a conversation with an agent recently who uh, they he has a buyer and they're, they're, the house I think was listed for 1.2 mm -hmm. and full well knowing they were going to go over ask. Like this is like the 10th or 15th home that they've made an offer on they're not getting. And they went in, so it was, it was listed for 1.2. They went in with a 1.35 offer and the selling agent said, Nope. And I, and my first reaction was, why in the hell did you list it for 1.2? Exactly. That makes no sense. It, it, but that's what's happening. That's what's yeah. happening in today's environment. And so it, there's kind of a, I guess, a reverse psychology here of how this is working. It's almost like they're underpricing stuff. It, it, you know, depending on the market, you get overpricing and let them come down. Now it's like I underprice it and let them just bid. It's interesting because I'm not seeing that here. I know probably it happens in some markets. I've also not seen it in the over million, million and a half dollar range. Like I'm sitting on Clearwater Beach and our pricing on these condos that I'm in right now went shot up to 1.8 and now they're slowly starting to come back down, right? There, there's two things I tell people in a negotiation. One is never fall in love with the product or whatever it is you're buying, because if you do, it's going to make you make bad decisions that aren't in your best favor. 
-hmm. And number two, always be willing to walk away from a negotiation. I always tell people there are a million deals out there. If this house isn't the house for you, then it's not the house for you. You need to go find a different one. Okay. Don't overpay. Now, the flip side of that is if this is the house you intend to be for the rest of your life and you have no intention of ever selling it, you don't really care what the value is and you don't care what how much the equity is going to go up because you're going to die in this property and this is where you want to die. That's a different conversation. Mm -hmm. Most people aren't really in that, that, that scenario though. This is a house they're going to be in for five to seven years. And I just, I don't overpay. I just don't. I'll find another deal somewhere. Or weirdly enough, that deal may come back. You know, how many times have you ever seen a house get sold and then come back off the market because the appraisal didn't come in right, or the people changed your mind, or they got cold feet, or they found a better deal. And then they come back to you and go, hey, by the way, is that offer still good? Right? I don't get emotionally involved in those deals, and I just keep right on rolling. I'll find yeah. another one. Yeah. It's interesting. Well, let me let me give you another scenario um, of another no that I think a lot of agents are receiving nowadays, which isn't about price, but it's about just selling their home. Mm -hmm. And so it's, it's the conversation now is, is you've got uh, an entire really generation of, of humans that are ready to downsize uh, baby boomers primarily. And, and they're just saying, eh, I'm going to go ahead and stay in this oversized house because I have a 3% interest rate and I can downsize and get a six or 7% interest rate and I'm gonna have the same payment. So I'm just going to go ahead mm -hmm. and stay in this big house. Are, are you, would you be coaching and teaching an agent to try to overcome that? Or are you going to accept and nurture? You know, A, we, this is funny. Who is it? Dave Ramsey, buy the house now. Interest rates are going to come down. Just refinance when they do. Yeah. You find what you want. It's a good deal. So you might pay a little bit more for the next year, but we all know interest rates are going to start coming down in 2024. So there's that train of thought, right? The other train of thought is, uh, and I hear this all the time. I've seen a thousand videos on this assumable FHA mortgages. Why can't you go find another house that's got an assumable mortgage? So sell yours, go find another one you can assume or do it in the flip reverse, find the one you want and sell. So there's that option as well. There's, Again, not, there's not as many of those as people think though, I don't think. I, I didn't think there was, but everybody keeps telling me that, you know, I keep seeing the videos. I all think it's online. just content and it allows them the opportunity to open the door. But yeah, that's not very common. Go on. Yeah. Again, I think it gets back to what you want. It, it, is if. If you intend to do something and they're going to be there for the rest of your life, then do it. If it doesn't make financial sense right now, then don't do it. I mean, uh, we are not going to force people into making bad decisions and we shouldn't be forcing people into making bad decisions. And if selling your house at 2% and buying one at six, that's smaller for the same price. To me, that doesn't sound like a very good decision. So I wouldn't do it. Put them in the pipeline, nurture them. If a deal comes along, you know, help them jump on it. So that is the answer. Okay. That, that's yeah. good to know. That's good to know. Um, is there anything else that you're seeing uh, that I haven't asked that you feel like would be something super relevant to a real estate audience? Um, it's a, it's an interesting uh, market today in the real estate world. And again, I think I said a minute ago, I bought like 10 properties in the last year and a half, and we've had some good appreciation and now it's bouncing around a little bit. I think something that you said a minute ago, from a real estate agent's perspective is also key. And that is interest rates have gone up so much that a lot of this younger generation aren't even interested in buying, that they're going to rent. So if you have investors or people that can afford to do that, I think that's a good market. I bought 19 actually totally between Georgia and Florida, all rental properties paid cash. They all cash flow very well. Um, I, I, I tend to follow Chris Crone's advice and staying in the 200 to $250,000 range on the properties that I buy, because you're not going to get hit by uh, deflation, so to speak, on those properties. But I think there's a big market in, in the rental market out there for agents, whether they get involved personally or find people who are looking to do it. So yeah, yeah. And and the and the the data says that actually there's going to be a large um influx of of landlords actually renewing or even kicking out uh you know maybe even long tenured tenants because the price of rent is increasing so rapidly. Mm -hmm. And so it's only a matter of time. Now that's, that's a twofold thing. That's, that encourages basically what you just said and reinforces what you said, because the opportunity to rent and actually cash flow pretty well is going to be very good. On the other side of the fence, rental prices are probably going to not only catch, but pass mortgage prices. And now you're going to have a whole nother marketing strategy to market to renters to say, buy because you're going to be paying more in rent. So I've got a spreadsheet I run on all of our properties and our, 
we conceptually work it like this. We buy the property, we pay cash. And not everybody can do that, but I do because I don't want to get hurt. I don't believe in borrowing every dollar you can borrow. If you take all of the rent money that you get, which is essentially tax-free because of depreciation, right? And you reinvest it into more properties on a consistent basis. If your rent goes up 5% a month, and in my range at 22 to 2,000 to 2,200, that's about a hundred bucks a year. If your rent goes up 5% a year and you can get 5% appreciation on average, that rental portfolio will double every seven, every seven years. Between the rent going up, taking all the cash, buying another property, putting it for rent, more cash, more property, whatever amount you invest will double every seven years. And you'll get that money essentially tax-free. So there are amazing things you can do in real estate. And if you're an agent and you're out there beating the bushes, finding deals like this, I just think it's a wonderful opportunity for people to build lifetime generational wealth in the real estate business. Yeah, it goes back to you, you have the key to you have the key to access. And so many agents are so focused on helping investors find them. Why are they not becoming the investor themselves? Yeah. Get a good deal, buy it, rent it. Go get another deal, buy it. Don't live on the money. That's the worst thing you can do. Mm -hmm. Take all your money and reinvest. Yeah. So, yeah. I mean, although going back to what you said about buying with cash, I mean, you're the anomaly. You're the unicorn in that regard because there's, you know, a lot of agents are not in that position. They're not sitting mm -hmm. on an influx of cash. Or if they do have, you know, a couple hundred thousand dollars in, in savings, they're not going to deplete it to go buy a house with cash. Find so an investor call. or yeah. be the agent for somebody else like me that's doing it. There are a lot yeah. of people out there that do this. I mean, I've read statistics where properties are getting bought up even by the big institutions right now and turned into rentals because they believe the rental market's just going to explode. Yeah. Yeah, I, I agree. It is. It is. So there's a lot of opportunity, both in mm -hmm. uh, being that agent, marketing to investors, but also potentially being that investor. That's that's the camp I'm in. Uh, and I'm mm -hmm. kind of gearing up, gearing things up to say, hey, we got to be on the ready uh, to build a portfolio because there's going to be a lot of opportunity. Big time. I love it. Brian, what uh, what kind of parting thoughts? What, uh, what do you want to leave our audience with? You know, again, I'm going to repeat what I said earlier. The most important thing you can do in any business, and that includes being a real estate agent, is get a good coach or a mentor. You find somebody that's 20 steps ahead of you that can help you build your business, you're going to succeed. If you don't, you're just going to keep making mistakes over and over that you don't need to make. There are people out there that can speed your success timeline up. You just got to find them and get some help. And uh, you can have anything you want in this world. You can be as successful as you want. If you're willing to check your ego, get a coach and listen. Yeah. I think that, I think that's probably one of the most defining traits of successful people. They've all, mm -hmm. they've all are, and many of them coached by multiple coaches. It's not just one. Um, so that's, that's super valuable. It's, it's almost like the rule of five, you know, it's, it's who you surround yourself with and it's not, and it's, and I don't know if you, if you, 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 you didn't allude specifically to hiring a coach, but really just, you know, upgrade your circle. Uh, mm -hmm. upgrade the people that you spend time with and surround yourself with people that you can learn from and, and shut up and listen. And ask I get people questions. call me all the time saying, Hey man, can I sit down with you for 10 minutes and have coffee? I just like, sure. I have friends that have me sit down with their kids. Hey, my kids want to do this. We, yeah, I don't need to charge everybody that, yeah. that wants some advice, but it's so important that you do that. I mean, I love it. Tim Cook runs Apple computer. He has a coach. Yeah, that's, that's, I, I, like I said, that's, that's one common theme. When I talk to successful people, they all have coaches and many of them multiple coaches. Yep. I love it. What's the best way for people to connect with you? Go to my website, www.brianwillmedia.com. People laugh at me because I say www. It makes me sound old, but it's brianwillmedia.com. And my podcasts are on there. My books, my coach, everything's on there. Awesome. And the book know the psychology of sales negotiation, uh, get it on Amazon. I assume it's sold everywhere. Yep. All the, yeah. Amazon's a big one and all my books are on there. Yeah. The dropout multimillionaire. And then the, I give the dumb kids hope. Those are the three books. I love it. We'll uh, make sure we link them in the show notes. So check it out. Uh, go check out uh, Brian Will Media, www.brianwillmedia.com. I'll jump on that bandwagon with you. You got uh, it. <laughs> Brian, it's it's been a pleasure, man. It's been it's been fun chatting. I hope we can stay in touch and uh, and and good luck. Good luck uh, meeting the next three. Jeff, I appreciate it. It was awesome today. Thank you. Thank you. Black Coat Agents Podcast.